Hi everyone, welcome to the Art of the Possible series. I'm Nihali Niyogi. I'm a principal cloud solution architect at Microsoft. This video is part of the playlist on integrated NVAs in VVAN, and more specifically, today's topic is uh, Palo Alto, the cloud NGFW, the SaaS offering. Today with me, I have two amazing guest speakers and one of the top networking professionals I've met in the industry. I have Cynthia Treger, who is a global black belt at Microsoft from our EMEA France office, focused on Azure networking. And I have Anton Budilowski, who is a technical alliance architect at Palo Alto Networks. Cynthia and Anton, I have truly enjoyed working with both of you on the series and fine tuning all the content. So we also on this call, we also have an outstanding and a very diverse panel of QA, a Q&A panelist who are networking focus specialists across the broader Microsoft organization, GBB, FastTrack, CSAs, PSAs, partner solution architects, and part PTSs, partner strategist. And LinkedIn profiles for all of the guests are, and the panelists are below. Again, welcome everyone, and thank you, Cynthia and Anton, for co-presenting co with me today. Um, Cynthia, anything you want to add about the overall vision for this session? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Niali, for the introductions. Uh, super happy to be here with you, uh, with you both. Uh, yeah, maybe just to add that the overall goal uh, of the series is to raise awareness about Virtual One uh, and the different integration models we have for third party uh, pro uh, vendors. So, either in the security field or uh, for uh, SD1 connectivity as well. Uh, we have a really close partnership with the top security players, and we will see uh, today that thanks to Virtual One and uh, managed offers like the one. Uh, Anton will present with the uh, Cloud Next Gen Firewall that it's super easy for customers to integrate their preferred firewall solution. Uh, and um, I think I will let uh, Anton uh, go into the details of that uh, later. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Neali, and welcome, Anton. Thank you again, Anton, for, uh, for joining us. Um... So if you've been following along with us in the VVAN overview series and the kickoff session, we covered some common VVAN scenarios and touched upon integrated NVAs, right? So what you see on my screen is a multi-region VVAN architecture. And for the completeness um, and, and continuity uh, of the video, I, I do want to just quickly touch upon um, the different integrations with security partners, SD-WAN partners, and dual role. And today, uh, the Palo Alto uh, SaaS offering is kind of unique uh, in that sense. And Anton's going to go into the detail. And all of these are hyperlinked, and it takes you right to the, the documentation. Of course, today's focus is uh, Palo Alto Cloud and GFW. So from an architecture perspective, um, let me touch upon the the underlying um, concept of uh, routing um, intent over here. So if you think about it with routing intent, like Cynthia mentioned, it opens up uh, integrations with a lot of, in addition to the native offers, it op opens up integrations with a lot of the third party NVAs and um, SaaS as well as NVAs, right? So from the traffic flow perspective, we offer uh, internet bound traffic, everything kind of funneling through the, uh, the firewall and then private traffic, likewise, private traffic all kind of going um, through the firewall. Of course, the interhub tra traffic traverses the, the firewall twice, but the routing intent feature sort of lays the foundation uh, for, um, for uh, uh, integrated NVAs and the SaaS offering as well. And so just coming back from a placement perspective, Palo SaaS sits right here. Uh, anything else, Cynthia, that I missed or you want to add about, uh, you know, when you combine some of these offers, there are some considerations as well. So if you want to bring up anything. Uh, yeah, so um, 
I think it's important to highlight that in the case of Palo Alto, we have um, we're talking about a SaaS solution as opposed to managed NVAs. Uh, uh, we can run with other security vendors. So the construct of the SaaS uh, solution and the cloud next-gen next firewall is a bit different, and uh, Anton will go into the details of that uh, later. Um, and so just as today, as you said, uh, just as today we have um, se security solutions that can be integrated uh, in the hub, we also have con connectivity solutions like SD1 connectivity integrated straight into uh, the vHub. However, today uh, it's not possible yet to combine both a managed SD1 uh, solution with a managed security solution. Great point. Thank you, Cynthia. So with that, um, over to uh, you, Anton. Take it away. Uh, thanks, Nihali. Thanks, Cynthia. Uh, so I'm going to take over the screen share, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, all right. So. Uh, uh, Cloud and GFW for Azure is the star of the show today. Uh, so this solution was jointly built by Microsoft and Palo Alto Networks. Uh, and I'll go over a few things, uh, uh, why, why, why it's different, what, what the unique uh, characteristics of the solutions are, uh, the, and why, why, why we did it together, uh, Microsoft and Palo Alto Networks. Uh, so Palo Alto Networks is, is known for building firewalls for many, many years. Uh, so our next generation uh, firewall platform uh, offers well, hardware or virtual um, firewalls that are layer seven. We're able to look into the application layer uh, and, and evaluate what's what what what, the, what that application is what the traffic is not just by, by looking at urls or fqdns uh, but actually looking at the contents of the packets and headers and everything and applying uh, application signatures and other behavioral type of analytics to determine is this application a or is it something that is trying to look like that application and all of that is uh, leveraging uh, our cloud delivered security services. So uh, every single Palo Alto firewall out there is inspecting this in line in real time. So any, um, let's say you're uh, getting a, um, a request to a certain URL, uh, we can uh, analyze that URL in real time uh, with leveraging those cloud services as, as that traffic, as that request is passing through the firewall. Uh, we run uh, machine learning models on the firewall and in the cloud uh, to also help uh, with that inspection, prevent zero day uh, threats and anything that's already known. And all of that telemetry is funneled back in our, into our cloud. We have uh, uh, unit 42, which is a uh, threat, uh, uh, threat intelligence unit that the researchers there uh, working 24 hours and uh, uh, analyzing what, what's out there, what, what, what are the bad actors are, what's their next thing that they're going to uh, try and use uh, maliciously against uh, uh, enterprises, which are both customers of Microsoft and Palo Alto Networks. Running firewalls in the cloud is, uh, it, it could be a challenge. You need a skillful team uh, to uh, run those appliances. So typically that team would have a hardware firewall on, uh, you know, on-prem. And then when they move to Azure, they would deploy it as a, as a network virtual appliance. That's, that's, that's been the model uh, for, for a while uh, until, until the, the SaaS, SaaS happened. So, uh, Cloud and GFW uh, kind of mirrors these two things, uh, our threat efficacy and our uh, best-in-class security uh, from Palo Alto Networks and the cloud native ease of use of Azure. Um, so the, when you uh, use Cloud and GFW, there's no, no maintenance. You don't need to worry about software updates. Uh, you don't need to manage individual VMs. It comes with automatic 
uh, scaling. So it's dynamic, it scales out and back in depending on the traffic load that you uh, send through the service. Uh, it's resilient, so it's aware of uh, Azure availability zones. So should something happen, there's there are mechanisms to auto repair. Uh, and again, we try to make sure where there's no single point of failure. Uh, and it is tightly integrated into Azure's uh, uh, ARM, so Azure Resource Manager framework. So we are actually an object within Azure API. So that makes automation and DevOps super easy because it looks and feels as a native service. So this is the general general uh, kind of level setting of what Cloud and GFW is and, and why, why we did this. Um, I'm going to... Uh, describe, okay, what, what what's there for the customer? If, if we're taking care of our, all the things and they just work, well, uh, th th there's still security policy. So that's that's what customers will still do. So uh, creating power rules, policies, uh, managing threat profiles, uh, managing dynamic contents, so apps, threats, antivirus packages, uh, and, uh, and, and routing as well. So using either, you know, the virtual WAN, uh, doing the routing, uh, we leverage routing intent, uh, as Nihal introduced in the beginning of the call. Uh, but it doesn't have to be virtual WAN, it could be virtual network with the traditional hub and spoke model. And in that case, uh, you would just create your user-defined route, assign it to, you know, prefixes that you want to inspect through the firewall, and we just become a next hop. That's that's all we are. All that complexity is abstracted and hidden uh, from you, uh, as long as you route that traffic to that private IP in your hub uh, virtual network. We will apply your policy and inspect the traffic and take the action. Uh, on the infrastructure side, uh, as I said, the service automatically scales. We are able to scale up to 100 GBP AES, so it's, uh, it's, it's pretty solid. And uh, this works with virtual WAN data plane as well. Uh, and here I want to highlight uh, and kind of uh, predict a question. Uh, so virtual WAN SKU and the you know the this what you know the number of VMs is it's applicable to the router component of virtual WAN. The data plane is we we, we live in the world of SDN, so the data plane is separate. So uh, even with the the lowest SKU of uh, virtual WAN, uh, we're still able to reach that because we. That goes through the data path, not through uh, not through the router. Very important uh, thing to remember. You don't have to, unless you have a need for it. You have so many EMs and prefixes that V1 needs to manage. Um, there's no need. There's no dependency on the virtual WAN hub SKU to reach that 100 GBPS. Uh, the service comes with a 4.9 SLA, so we have a, we have a policy uh, for that and. And that guarantees that it's going to be up, uh, and you have that you know assurance. Uh, it's not just an NBA that you're responsible for; it's a service. Um, all right. So this is kind of where where the split between what's what's who's responsible for what, and Palo Alto Networks owns this service. So that means if there is an issue. Uh, you don't need to point fingers. Is this Microsoft? Is it Palo Alto Networks? Uh, you can uh, open your support case uh, from Azure Portal, but with Palo Alto Networks. And we will deal with, we will investigate it, we'll triage it, our support teams. Uh, since it's a service, you no longer need to uh, troubleshoot. Uh, those VMs because they are under our control. So we can take packet captures, we can take uh, technical support files and uh, investigate. And if if there is some underlying uh, issue that we need to follow up with Azure team, we'll do it on your behalf. Uh, so that's a nice thing. You, you, you only need to speak to one support team. Um, all right. Uh, this service is available today in 32 regions. So we are closely following virtual WAN customers. But uh, as I said, you can deploy it in, in a hub and spoke VNet as well. So uh, this list uh, uh, grows. Every uh, two or three months, we release new regions based on the demand. But as you can see, we're, uh, I think we're in all of the US regions. 
software uh, in Canada, Europe, uh, Asia Pacific, uh, South America, uh, and, and the Middle East. And, and we also recently launched uh, South Africa as well. Um, so uh, that, that, gi that gives us global footprint and with virtual win and inter-region traffic inspection, uh, as, uh, as Nihali showed in the diagram, uh, it, it gets pretty powerful. So you can have a global footprint with uh, consistent security applied when you traverse, uh, you know, across the globe through your virtual virtual WAN network. Um, and here uh, uh, is a good uh, good uh, points to um, to pivot into the architecture. But I'm going to pause to see if any of our panelists have any questions uh, of what what I've covered so far. Uh, yeah, Anton, Cynthia, I, I have a question actually on uh, the 100 gigabit per second you mentioned before. Mm -hmm. um, so um, you said that whatever the virtual one's queue is, or the, um, it, will, it will be able to scale up to 100 gigabit per second. But wouldn't that be related somehow to the size of the V-Hub uh, and um, underlying the uh, size of the subnet assigned to the um, uh, to the cloud NGFW? Uh, that's a great question, Cynthia. Cynthia thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, so the general guideline for virtual one hub is to uh, assign an address space of slash 23. Uh, however, uh, the way the service is implemented, uh, and I'll cover it in the next section, but uh, when you secure your virtual one hub with cloud and GFW, uh, within that address space of that virtual one hub, we will have uh, special subnets reserved for the firewall interfaces. So those interfaces will consume those IP addresses. And as we scale out in the back end, we will be creating more instances of our firewall and they will consume more IP addresses. So as we grow uh, to that uh, uh, 100 dbps will need more IP addresses. So the recommendation from Palo Alto Networks and the virtual WEN team that also <laughs> makes this possible is to go with slash 21 address space uh, to allow for that uh, 100 dbps um, to happen. If you go with lower numbers, uh, that bandwidth will be, that throughput will be limited. Uh, so the, rec the recommendation is to go with slash 21 that will ensure that you have enough addresses for all things VUN and Power Alto Networks Cloud and GFW. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Cynthia. Are there any other questions? All right. Do we have uh, any plans? Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, and right. one quick question. So, uh, because you said it is also supported in VNet, uh, but it's only through UDRs. Do we have any plan to support BGP? Or maybe you cover it later, too. Uh, so currently, BGP is not supported on cloud and GFW. Uh, this is a roadmap item. Uh, I don't have a, a date uh, where that uh, when when that will happen, but I will cover uh, some other things that are upcoming in later in the presentation. But the short answer is not yet available. Um, Mm -hmm. And I, I, I see the use case in the absence of virtual WAN that does BGP. It, 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 there's, a, there's a definitely a use case there. So we can, uh, we, do, we do support it on our platform. It's just not exposed to, um, uh, to Cloud and GFW yet. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, so uh, let's cover kind of the basics of the deployment models. Uh, Cloud and GFW can be deployed in hub and spoke VNets, uh, where it's do it yourself hub, you own your VNets. Uh, and this is very common for things like landing zones, uh, Azure landing zones, where the, you have your uh, landing zone uh, my architecture migrating uh, services into Azure, uh, and uh, having an AKS cluster, for example, there, and uh, there will be uh, some sort of hub VNet or shared services VNet where everything will connect to. And that's that's the spot where the firewall typically goes. Um, and we're able to get deployed into that uh, hub VNet. The only thing that we require is that you allocate uh, two subnets for us. Uh, and those subnets need to be slash 25 or more. 
uh, again, for scaling purposes. And we will plug into that sub. Uh, virtual win, uh, similar idea, uh, but we deploy right into the hub. Uh, both models support all three flows. So you can do inbound, so exposing an application out to the internet, and we can come in and uh, you can basically, you will use one of the public IP addresses assigned to, to the cloud NGFW to get the traffic into your network. And then you can create uh, destination net rules to get it to its destination within Azure, or it could be a VPN connection or an express route back to your on-prem. Uh, there isn't, uh, it play, plays nicely with Azure Application Gateway. If you'd like to throw in that web application firewall, the, you know, the, a, the uh, have that uh, L7 HTTP router in front of it. Maybe if you if you can terminate TLS on the on cloud NGFW, or you can terminate TLS on application gateway. It's it's up to you. So uh, these options are available. So you you get to decide uh, how you want to approach it. Uh, but since we are pretty much native in Azure, uh, you can play with you know those different combinations. Uh, and and achieve and uh, and meet your requirements. So, uh, diving a little bit deep on, into the networking, uh, when you deploy the Cloud NGFW resource, everything is a resource in Azure, right? So, uh, the resource itself is is one single entity, and that's how it's manifesting in a to the user in their subscription. In the back end, uh, Palo Alto Networks, we have a our service, which runs a specialized software stack, there are hooks, deep hooks into uh, Azure underlying services uh, that manage the Azure infrastructure. Uh, we allocate a subscription for that particular instance. So there's no traffic mixing, there's no multi-tenancy there. It's it's a dedicated subscription for that one cloud in GFW. Uh, so this way we can guarantee uh, privacy and that no one else traffic is not mixed with anybody else's. And also we can guarantee the resources and scaling. Uh, in that subscription, we deploy, we were not reinventing the wheel, we're using other Azure services. So we deploy a virtual machine scale set. And we're also not reinventing the firewall. We already have a great firewall, which is VM series. So in that scale set, we, run, we deploy individual VM series. We start with three. Uh, and then we scale out as we need to because we monitor uh, the traffic load on, uh, on, uh, on the service. And we close it up in this, uh, this, this sandwich with two load balancers. So one public load balancer and one internal load balancer to enable all those three traffic flows, ingress, egress, and east-west. Uh, and what happens next is really magic because these interfaces that this firewall uh, is deployed with, they're injected into the hub VNet. And the IP addresses are assigned to those interfaces, and it's a cross-subscription, cross-tenancy thing. Uh, there's no tunneling, there's no BGP required. It's transparent and as if, you know, as if that firewall uh, actually existed in your hub VNet. And all that all that's left is to set your user defined route to that private IP address that is actually associated with our internal load balancer, and that traffic gets inspected. So you can create the quad zero default route if you want to inspect everything, and that would be our recommendation, uh, zero trust uh, architecture. Uh, or you can slice it up and do it prefix by prefix. Uh, there are use cases where you know you deploy a database and you don't want to inspect it because of latency, but since it's the same region in the same AZs, uh, that latency is as if you had it in your own, you know, in that VNet, uh, in that subscription, in that resource group. So th those those latency numbers apply because we run it right next to it. Um, okay, so this is virtual network. Uh, do it your own, do do, do it yourself uh, uh, hub. So um, and. I'm going to talk about virtual WAN, but I'm going to pause just to uh, we can close off the virtual network part. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, I see yes. Mays, you had your question uh, hand raised, and then Cynthia, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So, Anton, do we um, like do we have the same VM series type that's used for, let's say, uh, Palo with a VM licensing and the Palo and next generation firewall? Let's say they both, for example, see uh, using the VM uh, seven hundred series, or is it different? Uh, or do we have question. option? The customer have option. Option. Yeah. yeah. That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, so it is the same VM series. Uh, we do use a PanOS release that is a, a we, we don't use the latest. If you go to the marketplace by default, you'll get the, the latest uh, PanOS version unless you specify the specific one that you want. So we do go because it's the service. We go with the recommended release uh, out to the field. I believe today it's 10 to 7 as of today. Uh, in terms of the VM size, uh, we use an equivalent of uh, VM. It's somewhere in between 300 and 500 uh, for certain numbers that we guarantee and they're published in the documentation are equivalent to uh, 500. So the number of objects and policies. Um, and then the in terms of like number of cores, it is equivalent to uh, VM 300. Uh, there is something in underway to, uh, to improve the vertical scaling of this service, uh, but I will leave it at that. Uh, but we are looking into it. There are use cases for that when, because it is horizontal scale. Yes, we can do 100 Gbps uh, overall, but that particular elephant flow that gets pinned to one instance, one core, it's still limited by the performance of that, you know, individual vCPU. So, uh, I guess to, yeah. To answer your question, yeah, it, it is. It is not. It's not seven hundred. It's closer to uh, uh, five hundred, uh, and we are looking into uh, other options to offer for those specific use cases where we need more throughput per session. We're looking into that. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, I think there was another one. Uh, yeah, and I have another question about uh, the. Um... Uh, the VMs in the background as well. So how many instances are deployed by default? It's three, right? Uh, by default is three, yes. Uh, that's what we started with, this, what we called cold start. Uh, and then uh, the scale out uh, happens as there is more load on that cluster. And our thresholds are pretty aggressive. So uh, when that CPU utilization, uh, and we're adding more metrics for that scaling algorithm. So it, it will consider other things uh, very soon. So we're constantly, like every, every probably every few weeks, we release uh, new things. And the nice thing about the service, as a user, as a customer, you just get, the service got updated and you didn't even notice, but you got more capabilities. So uh, yeah, it will scale out uh, based on that utilization and will scale out early. So as we see that load creeping up, we'll scale out pretty pretty early so that when we actually get to that 80% of utilization, we already have the instance ready to service traffic. All right. And are the thresholds, I mean, the upscaling thresholds, can they be customized? Uh, as of today, no. They are uh, set by our uh, by our engineering teams uh, that, that manage the service. So uh, they're, they're there's no um, today. There's no tweaking of that. Okay, and one last question on the mm -hmm. uh, downscaling. So, if there's no traffic, for example, during the weekend, could the deployment go below three instances? Uh, the minimum is three. It doesn't go okay. below. Uh, but I want to address probably the concerns. The number of VMs is really not relevant to the end user. Uh, because the service is not charged or built based on what, like the scale. If it, and I'll chat, I'll I'll, talk, I'll cover this topic. I have a section for pricing, but kind of to uh, uh, to 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 foresee the, uh, that 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 question again. Whether we run twenty instances for you in the back end or fifty or three. It's not relevant because it has no effect on uh, either either on pricing or on configuration or anything like that. So if over the weekend you end up with three and they're pretty idle, since you're not sending any traffic through it, you're not being charged because it's consumption based. 
OK, clear. Thank you for the question. Um, OK, let's shift gears into virtual win. Uh, so I'm and we've covered this uh, in the beginning quickly. Uh, what are you 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 you've embracing virtual win uh, because it makes things easy, it makes things efficient, it's fast. Uh, and how do you how do you, what, what are the security options that you have for, for that? Uh, so there's Azure Firewall, obviously that's that's the option that's available right away, and then there are third party solutions. Uh, with the third party solutions, there is an MVA uh, track. So uh, either you do it yourself uh, in a spoke VNet, like spoke transit VNet, and that's the model that our <laughs> VM series was following for quite a while, or you pick up a managed NVA, which makes it slightly more uh, streamlined to deploy it, and it's deployed into the virtual when uh, hub address space. It's still a VM, so all things VM apply to it. Uh, and the third approach is the SaaS approach, where it is the service with SLA with no infrastructure to manage. So these are the options, and uh, there are different aspects for these. To, when you consider how to secure a virtual one hub, you have to consider you, you you have to look at all those aspects individually and pick the option that's right for you. Uh, from Palo Alto Networks, as I said, we could go with the transit VNet approach, and now I'll have the diagram in the following slide how that looks. Uh, you could deploy Cloud and GFW, which is a SaaS. Uh, and we were missing from the list on the right for managed NDA program, but I'm at liberty to, uh, to, to share that this is coming very soon. Uh, and I'm not talking months, I'm talking weeks. Uh, so Palo Alto VM series will be offered as a managed NDA. And uh, I, I, I can cover like what the kind of what the differences are and what what you win uh, or lose with with each approach or where you have to compromise, and that's why I said uh, we as Palo Alto Networks we want to offer you every single way of consuming our firewall in virtual win, so that you pick uh, pick the one that's right for you. So uh, I'm going to cover the SaaS since this uh, that. Uh, Cloud and GW is the star of the show first. Uh, so we're doing we're not doing anything different than what we've already covered in virtual in virtual network. Mm -hmm. The only difference is now that Hub VNet is within the virtual one hub other space. So when you deploy your virtual one hub and you specify that slash 21 uh, address space, under the hood, there is a VNet, there are VNet peerings, uh, and when you Deploy your VPN gateway into that uh, virtual one hub. All of things, it's very similar, but it's a managed service, virtual one. So it, it's all kind of streamlined and automated. Uh, from our point of view, again, you deploy Cloud and GFW, it gets its own dedicated subscription, VMSS, load balancers, uh, a fleet of VM series. What do we do next? We put these interfaces into that VNet that is behind that virtual one hub address space. And that's where those subnets are allocated. Uh, and that's uh, when, yeah, I know it's less, says slash 25, but it is slash 21 recommended if you want to leverage the 100 GBPS scale. Uh, okay, so those interfaces are in those subnets. They're invisible to you because it's all under that address space. Uh, how, do you, how do you route the traffic then? So that's where routing intent comes uh, into play. Uh, you switch your routing policy, and I'll, I have a demo uh, in uh, in a little bit for you. But routing intent is is the way to uh, pin traffic through the firewall in virtual WAN. So routing intent allows you to uh, specify, okay, this traffic is public, so to or from the internet, and you can toggle it and send it through Cloud and GFW. And for RFC 1918 private. Uh, prefixes, you can also toggle it, whether you want to inspect that traffic and send it through through the firewall or not. Should you happen to have any non-RFC 1918 prefixes, so those public addresses that your organization uh, owns and uses internally, there is a way to add that exception as well, so that traffic is treated privately. So that 
that's how it works in virtual WAN. So pretty much the same mechanism. The only difference is we leverage route intent. Uh, when you enable route intents, you can know how to use custom route tables and all that. The only flexibility besides private and public, as I mentioned, the only other flexibility that you have is in your spoke, you can reject the default route and kind of locally break out from that uh, spoke. So that that's that's on the spoke connection to that B1 hub that you control that, and that will if effectively bypass the firewall. So th these are all... Uh, and there is there is a rationale behind that. Uh, again, zero trust. We do want to make sure that the firewall, the old traffic goes through the firewall. So even if you don't block it, at least you get your traffic logs and you can you know audit it later if you need to. Um, yeah. So this is the V1 architecture and how it works under the hood. Uh, I'm going to pause for quick pause for a question if there is any. Okay, uh, the beauty of it is uh, it works multi-region. So uh, you deploy cloud in GFW per hub. You can only deploy one cloud in GFW per V1 hub. Um, and as uh, I think Cynthia mentioned in the beginning of the call, as of today, you cannot combine, you cannot deploy two things in the hub. So you cannot have an NVA, whether it's SD-WAN, WAN optimization, or another firewall, and a SaaS, which is a cloud and GFW, you can only have one. Uh, so uh, you would deploy cloud and GFW into the V1 hub in each of your regions. Uh, regions are connected through that backbone network, and we support pretty much all of those flows. So VNet to VNet, uh, cross-region VNet, uh, DC branch VPN connection, express routes. Uh, outbound to the internet will always egress from from that local hub. We don't we we, we don't want the outbound traffic uh, to traverse internally and then exit from that region. Uh, that's uh, cross region traffic. So we want to avoid that. So we, we break out here from this hub locally and same with the with inbound. When you're coming in from the internet, you get you know inspected uh, uh, by this firewall not by that firewall. So uh, that's uh, that's just kind of that works. And all those flows are published on Microsoft Learn. So uh, you can always uh, check out the latest updates there. Um, so yeah, this is uh, uh, virtual WAN with inter-region traffic inspection. Uh, and another kind of aspect of it, uh, yes, it, it's going to be inspected twice in this scenario. And you might want to say like, well, I don't want to, because this is the service is consumption-based, I don't want to inspect it twice, but it could be that you're in West Europe or you know another region where there are different privacy laws and you, for example, can decrypt certain traffic and you cannot decrypt other traffic. Then you have uh, things like HIPAA in the US. So uh, having that flexibility of deploying the firewall per region and applying different sets of policies is actually very helpful because you can you can define different uh, you know external dynamic lists you can define different security profiles different URL categories and deploy them uh, strategically to those uh, you know instances of cloud and GFW in those regions separately and then when traffic traverses cross region the right policies are applied uh, in the right place. All right. So this was virtual WAN, the SaaS approach. So this is by far the easiest uh, and the most integrated way of securing your virtual WAN hub. Uh, there are some limitations to it. So as, and I, I will speak about them. Uh, today, you cannot terminate IPsec uh, tunnels on the firewall. So um, you can terminate them on Azure VPN gateway, no problem. Uh, and then that traffic becomes you know, east-west, you know, you, you, you got that traffic uh, into your VUN through that VPN gateway, and it will be routed using route intent through the firewall and your policies will be applied. Uh, you cannot, uh, yeah, you cannot terminate uh, things like Global Protect, which is also a flavor of IPsec. So again, uh, Global Protect is a Palo Alto uh, solution. 
uh, if you do need to terminate it, you can terminate on Azure VPN Gateway, but uh, that's not kind of a true Global Protect experience. So if you absolutely need Global Protect and you want Cloud and GFW in virtual when hub, uh, the approach is to deploy a pair of VM series for Global Protect clients in a spoke virtual network. So those turn tunnels are terminated on that pair of VM series, and then the traffic gets into the, the virtual when hub. And the same comes to SD-WAN. Uh, because of that limitation where you cannot have an NVA and a SaaS in the same hub, one approach is to have your SD-WAN terminated in a spoke VNet. You would have that island of your SD-WAN coming in through that spoke VNet, and then you come into your hub and centrally inspect things with the cloud and GFW. Yet there is another workaround is having two hubs in the same region. One hub will be uh, with the deployed NVA for SD-WAN, and the second hub would be your central hub for security where you would deploy Cloud and GFW. So there, again, there are different ways to achieve the same thing. Uh, hopefully in the future, we will be able to deploy uh, more than one SaaS or NVA or both in the same hub, and that would solve the problem. Um, so, I will go back to VM series, and if you were to deploy that VM series in a transit VNet, uh, this is the reference architecture that's been out for 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 a while. Uh, this is a non-service approach, so these are your VMs. You need to deploy them. You need to configure them, maintain them, update them, uh, everything in between. Uh, so, the upside of this is you have hundred percent control. You can SSH into these VMs. You can uh, go in and run commands, co do packet captures. Uh, it, it's 100% control. So for, for, for those customers who want to retain that and they're OK with that operational overhead, that's still there. Uh, if that's right for you, uh, go ahead and do it this way. Uh, the With Virtual WAN Hub context, uh, it, because it's a transit VNet, you do have to still use UDRs to pin that traffic to that transit VNet. And you, Virtual One Hub is really kind of becomes a spoke, which is kind of counterintuitive to what Virtual One virtual is for. Uh, but again, there are circumstances where this approach uh, works and it's available. Um, so managed NVA that is coming, uh, that's, uh, that's gonna be a VM series deployed in the hub just like may, maybe other vendors do uh, do, do it uh, that way. It's not a service. So it's still a virtual machine uh, that you, uh, you need to uh, think about things like, yeah, software upgrades, licenses. Um, however, what you would be able to do is terminate Global Protect and IPsec. So if you absolutely need uh, Global Protect and, and IPsec termination on the firewall and not on Azure VPN Gateway or something else, this approach would work for you because you will be able to by avoid that transit VNet and that UDR uh, chaos. Uh, you would still be able to leverage, you know, routing intent because it's a managed NDA, uh, and you would be able to terminate uh, global protect and IPsec tunnels uh, for those remote users. Uh, the scaling is slightly less, so it doesn't. It, it's a set sort of uh, scaling, so it doesn't dynamically grow. Um, so you define the SKU, how big it is, and that is fixed for that deployment. So that's how managed that, this is the difference between the SaaS and the managed NVA. With SaaS, we can dynamically grow it because we have a, we have a software that, the app that is actively managing that. With managed NVA, you kind of define your parameters at the beginning, you deploy it, and then you run with it. And if you need to change it, uh, in most cases, you would have to redeploy it. So this is that middle ground where, yeah, you cannot quite go SaaS. You still want to have that comfort of VM experience, and you need the, those features that might not be available on on the SaaS platform yet. So this is uh, this is Palo Alto giving you yet another option to consumer firewalls in virtual WAN. So this is going to be out in a few weeks. So stay tuned uh, and. Try it out when it's available, and uh, you know, share your feedback with us. And yeah, uh, we're working closely with Virtual WAN team to make all of these options available to you. All right. Uh, unless there are any questions about uh, these approaches to secure Virtual WAN Hub, 
I'm going to shift gears into policy management. Yeah, uh, I just have a question on um, the managed NVA deployment. So uh, throughput goes from 1 to 30 gig, uh, and the throughput is selected by the number of scale unit yeah. um, we set during the deployment, right? Mm -hmm. And what happens if, let's say, I have a deployment of 10 gig and want to change to 30 gig. Will that create a redeployment or will uh, the upgrade be automatic and transparent? Um, the solution is not out yet, so take my response with a grain of salt. Uh, but my understanding is that you define the scale unit in the beginning. So if you define the scale unit that's 30 and you're sending 10, then it won't need the redeployment because the, that that scale is already reserved. Uh, but if you if, if you pick the scale unit that corresponds to 10 gig, yes, most likely, I, I'm I'm fairly certain you would have to redeploy because scale okay. units cannot be changed after the deployment. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and, yeah, and I, I believe this is not only Palo Alto VM series. This uh, applies to to other NDAs as well. Other yeah. Vendors. Because it and comes yeah. with mm -hmm. the uh, underlying VMs deployed, probably, and it would mean redeploying the right VMs so we get the right throughput. Right. Uh, yep. Thanks for the question, Cynthia. OK, so we've covered a fair bit of infrastructure. Uh, now let's uh, move into policy. Uh, so policy management, um, most of the time, you if you use a third party, Vendor, it would be through their uh, management platform. Uh, with Cloud and GFW and SaaS approach, we actually are able to offer you native security policy management right in Azure Portal. So we do have uh, an object called local rule stack in Azure. So in Azure Portal, in APIs, RESts, again, Terraform, 100% Azure. So you can manage your policy right there. So you are able to leverage our app ID, URL filtering, our security profiles, so IPS. Uh, you can decrypt traffic uh, in both directions, inbound and outbound. So open up TLS, leverage Azure Key Vault, and get the certificates for decryption from Azure Key Vault, and they will be associated with your rule stack and then on per rule basis you can decrypt the traffic so you match the rule you don't want to decrypt it you match another rule and you want to decrypt it and in that model you can also send your logs uh, to azure log analytics workspace so that works nice with what microsoft sentinel so uh this is for 100 percent azure shops this makes a lot of sense uh because it's all native all azure have one Terraform provider and manage it all, infrastructure and policy. Uh, there are some limitations, uh, obviously. Uh, so uh, this interface doesn't offer you um, every knob and whistle of our policy. So uh, things like external dynamic lists are not yet available. You can create custom things like custom app ID or custom URL category, uh, and you cannot tweak the security profiles there set to best practices to what Palo Alto Networks recommends. And that's that's kind of, that's the, the lay of the land there. Uh, it's still very powerful way of managing your policy. So you do get advanced URL filtering, threat prevention, uh, and, uh, and the DNS security as well. Uh, you can leverage DNS proxy to look into your DNS request response traffic. Uh, very common vector for bad, for you know for bad uh, bad actors, and keep it keep it all in Azure. However, for anyone who already have Palo Alto firewalls, whether it's VM series or hardware, or those cases where you do need that fine tuning uh, on the policy, we offer Panorama. So Panorama has been around for many years. It's a mature management policy management policy and firewall management platform uh, from Palo Alto Networks. It uh, can offer you, you know, monitoring capabilities. You can uh, send your logs to Panorama and Panorama Log Collector if you want to have it uh, kind of dedicated log collector instance and view those logs in Panorama. Uh, and yeah, it, it does. It offers you pretty much full spectrum of 
of security policy management. And the beautiful thing about it, it can manage any Palo Alto firewall. So if you have still have Palo Alto on-prem, you may have them in other clouds, and then you can have that under you know single pane of glass, consistent policy across all your environments, uh, all form factors, centrally managed from Panera. Uh, this is the op these are the options available today, uh, but I do want to uh, uh, give you a sneak peek. Uh, we do have another platform that's uh, available already for our hardware firewalls and VM series. Uh, it's called Strata Cloud Manager. So this is a I I'd like I like to describe it as Panorama SaaS, uh, which is quite under understating its advantages. So Strata Cloud Manager is a SaaS service. So you don't need to run your VM or hardware appliance. It's out there. You, you know, you subscribe for it. You you go and 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 use that uh, platform uh, to do all things Palo Alto. So and it's not just firewall. It also covers our SASE platform, so Prisma Access. So that's that's a level up. Not only you have one single pane of glass for all things network security, but also your SASE SD WAN. So and it's uh, fueled with AI tools, it can uh, aggregate those all the telemetry and logs under the same umbrella. And it can give you AI insights on, you know, what's what's going on in the network from the security perspective, what actions are recommended, where you need to do some changes. In some cases, it can automatically apply those changes. So it's a kind of a closed loop assurance where we detect a problem and then we remedy it automatically. So this is just a sneak peek. Uh, the, you, this slide is very busy, so it's got, you know, it relies on all of our, uh, you know, goodies, all our CDSS services. Um, uh, this support for Cloud and GFW is coming in October. Uh, so on top of VM series and hardware firewalls, Cloud and GFW for Azure will also be supported from Strata Cloud Manager. So uh, this makes things even easier because you don't need to manage your panorama appliance. Uh, and the, and manage everything in one spot. Uh, I do have some screenshots just to, to flash them in front of you. It has, since it's a web-based platform and uh, it's a SaaS, uh, it's a new product. We obviously invested a lot and it, it just looks super nice. It, it can give you nice graphs, nice dashboards, live view of what's going on in your, on your firewalls, in your SASE uh, Prisma Access Network um, and provide you with those you know, real-time insights and recommendations and even some automatic remedies. So uh, just gonna flash those screenshots. Uh, this will be available in October. Uh, so definitely check that out. It's, it, you don't have to jump off the Panorama train. The Panorama is not going anywhere. So if you have Panorama today, you can continue managing your cloud and GFW with that. Uh, but this is this is something that's uh, going to be available for cloud and GFW customers. Uh, and cloud and GFW for Azure is no exception. OK. Uh, I do have a section for automation, just to give you, uh, again, the lay of land of what's available uh, and how, like, why, why do we say it's native? Um, so I'm going to quickly cover that. When you you don't need a separate login, you don't need a separate identity to consume Cloud and GFW. It's all and I apologize, it's Entra. <laughs> it's not Azure AD. Uh, I I think I, I I've updated ten versions of these slides, and yet I still have Azure AD somewhere. <laughs> uh, I mentioned Key Vault, virtual networks, virtual WAN, so all of that is tightly integrated. Uh, on the DevOps uh, front, uh, you can use. Is there a question? I think uh, someone was asked a question. There? No? Okay, maybe that was just background noise. Uh, because Cloud GW is part of ARM, you can use ARM templates to deploy the firewall. And that rule stack that I mentioned, since it's in Azure, you can also use ARM to deploy it and manage it. Uh, naturally, that extends to Azure CLI and PowerShell. So we have a module and a library for those tools. Uh, SDK and REST clients, uh, they're also available. And Terraform, 
it's Azure RM Terraform provider. So if you if you can deploy these through code easily, uh, my demo setup that I'm going to show you in a few minutes, I deployed it with Terraform. So we, we do have this documented. It's documented on HashiCorp uh, where the provide, Azure provider is published. Uh, so it's really, really powerful. And if you manage your policy on Panorama, we do have PanOS Terraform provider. So you can split that responsibility where uh, you use one Terraform provider to deploy the firewall and then another Terraform provider to deploy your policy, deploy and manage your policy. So automation becomes uh, really, really beautiful. Um, and yeah, we do have uh, documentation. There's pan.dev portal where you can uh, you know look at the examples. Uh, so that's automation. Logging, I didn't mention that we can send logs to Azure Log Analytics Workspace, which is part of Azure Monitor. We're also looking at event hubs and storage controllers to just dump, dump those logs there. That's still uh, a road by Python. So um, to sum it up, I believe, yeah, uh, before I moved to pricing. So yeah, we've covered management, integration with Azure Native Services. Um, so no infrastructure to manage does scale and automatically, and it's turnkey. You don't have to do anything. Uh, no software upgrades because they are managed by Palo Alto, uh, and you can still retain your policy if you uh, if you want uh, with things like Panorama. All right, um, I'm going to pause for questions to see if there, there's anything like regarding the policy or automation, and then we're going to quickly cover the pricing model. All right, so as I mentioned, uh, it is consumption-based. So uh, you only pay for what you use. Uh, if you compare it with the NVA approach, where you know you have to pick the size of the VM, and that's relevant because larger VMs are more expensive. Uh, then you run that VM, you have to pay for that compute. If you're deploying a cluster with load balancers, with VMSS and everything like that, so that's your extra expense that you have to be you know, planning for. With Cloud and GFW, everything is included in the Cloud and GFW charge. The only extra thing is DNF peering charges. So uh, if you go on your search engine and you look for uh, DNF peering charges, you'll find that it's, I think, one cent per gig uh, for in and out. Uh, so that is that remains extra. But everything else, everything that I showed you, the load balancers, the VMSS, the computes, the scaling, number of VMs doesn't matter. It's all included. Uh, so, in a hypothetical scenario, if you have, let's say, a virtual WAN with two regions, you need to deploy two Cloud and GFWs. So, one in region one, one in region two. So, that's where the number of resources. This is your per hour charge. So, the service is running. There is a there is a charge related to that uh, service being up. And the second component is traffic, and that's where that's that's where the consumption based model really kind of shows itself, the more traffic you send, the more you end up being charged. So if over the weekend there's no traffic, that's more economical than running a VM 700 that's sitting there idle. So um, that, and it could be either way. If you send too much traffic, maybe a VM approach would be more economical. So you really have to crunch the numbers to determine uh, what, what would make more sense. In these economic conditions, everyone is very cost cautious. So that's why we offer all the options. DM, soon managed NVA, and, and uh, SaaS with Cloud and GFW. Uh, so that traffic is per tenant. So one firewall can be your DR region, not doing anything. Another firewall may be your active. So this traffic is combined across your Azure tenant. Uh, and then a la carte services. So these are, the services advanced threat, advanced URL, wildfire, which is our sandboxing service where we detonate file samples that go through your network and we determine if that firewall that file was actually some malware. And DNS security, as I mentioned, DNS request response traffic, uh, we can also uh, leverage that cloud service. Uh, these are de these depend on your configuration. Once again, you can have your DR firewall with just basic stuff, uh, and then you can have your active firewall with everything turned on. Uh, and these just multiply, uh, become multipliers in this formula. 
and you can the, this estimator is public so if you search for cloud and gfw pricing estimator in your bing search uh, you will find the link for this. Just make sure to select Azure because we do have other clouds. Um, and it's on the marketplace, so you can pick it up today. You don't even have to speak to Palo Alto or Microsoft because there's pay as you go plan. You can deploy it. There is a 330 day trial, so you can go and try it out uh, and not, you know, not being charged for it. Uh, once the trial is over, this is the pricing that will be applied. Uh, we do have credits that you can purchase. Uh, credits, uh, think of it as a prepay. So you decide that you like this, this is how you want to secure your Azure network, whether it's virtual network hub and spoke or virtual WAN. Uh, you determine that you need X number of credits. Again, those credits cover Azure infrastructure. So you don't have to worry about your compute cost because it's included. You don't need to worry about your human cost because you don't have to have your team on Saturday nights upgrading those firewalls because uh, it's also you know, covered. And th this offers much, much better pricing. So credits uh, credits will always offer you better pricing because there is a term involved. So you can sign up for one, two, three years, uh, however you feel comfortable, uh, and uh, you will get better pricing on it. And that's, that's your prepayment. So sometimes it makes more sense for budgeting uh, in other cases, it's hard to estimate how much you're going to send, uh, like how much data secured is going to be there. So you can start on pay as you go, look how much you end up using, and then purchase credits after. Uh, the beauty of this, and this is again in contrast with uh, NVA, if you have bursts of traffic or if you run out of credits, it will just fall back to pay go. So any overage will be charged as pay as you go. The service never stops. You're going to be the, the packets will be passing, the bad packets will be blocked and dropped. Uh, there's no no stress. Oh, I'm running out of scale, or I'm run, running out of credits. Uh, what am I going to do? So this is a much uh, more uh, uh, safe environment because you know, like, should something happen, it will just go to pay as you go. If you have three months in a row where you're bursting, maybe you can top it up and get more credits. That's also an option. Okay. So uh, unless there are any questions about pricing, I will move into demo and show you what, what I was talking about for the last uh, 40 minutes. I think we're good. Thank you. All right. Uh, so. Uh, let's get to Azure Portal. So, um, as I said, this, uh, I believe you can still meet, see my screen, but let me know otherwise, so I don't speak in, into the void. Uh, Azure Portal, the service is available right here. So if you search for Cloud and GFW by Palo Alto Networks, it, it shows up right there. There's no extra step needed to find it or to uh, subscribe for it. And the deployment is so simple. You don't need to know much about Palo Alto, and maybe you need to know a little bit about Azure. So you need to know which uh, you know which security group uh, you're gonna deploy it. Uh, sorry, which resource group you're gonna deploy it. So we're gonna say uh, demo and give it a name and pick the region. So those 32 regions that I flashed earlier, they're all here. Uh, so let's uh, let's say deploy it in East US. This is your free trial and uh, what happens after. So I can turn the pricing, and you can you can pick whether you deploy it into a hub and spoke virtual network or virtual one hub. Uh, as I said, you you can carve out the space in your subnets and in your hub vnet. Public IP addresses for ingress. So one or more, these are your public IP addresses uh, from your subscription. So nothing new here. It, it will just transparently be attached to our backend. Uh, and for outbound, again, you can define the public IP addresses that you want to use for, for the outbound traffic, and that will be as you will source now to that IP address. Um, if you have those prefixes that you use privately, you can also specify them here so we know that this is private east-west traffic security policies so panorama 
or Azure Rule Stack. Uh, it, all, everything that I've talked to, the differences between uh, Azure Rule Stack and Panorama. Uh, DNS proxy, you can always enable this later. You don't have to make that decision uh, right now. Any tags that you might have with your automation or ADO, um, you accept the terms and you deploy this firewall in maybe what, five, six clicks. And it takes about 15 minutes to, for, for it to fully come up. So something that used to take, well, at least a week uh, can be deployed as easy as I'm demonstrating. And yes, there is an automation template, so you can export it into ARM and then modify it and tweak it later and deploy it uh, through the templates or, or you know, uh, PowerShell or, uh, or you know, whatever you want. Uh, from from the Azure perspective, it's just a resource. So this will go and deploy this. Uh, I'm not going to wait uh, that 15 minutes. I'm going to demonstrate how this is exposed in virtual WAN. So this is a virtual WAN. I do so have real pubs. quick, mm -hmm. Anton, sorry to sure. interrupt before you move away from that screen. Um, so you picked the hub and spoke. Um, sort of the network type. Um, so I, I wanted to see what the experience looks like if we had picked the hub and the VWAN hub. It doesn't prompt us for any other um, public, I'm sorry, the um, the subnets, right? Uh, thanks, Nihali, for pointing it out. It just shows you the hub. So the allocation and all of that mechanics that I described earlier, it all happens automatically in virtual WAN backend. So the the this this the service stack there will handle it. So you you don't have uh, any sort of way to tweak it. This is uh this is one way of deploying this into virtual WAN. So you can come in here, select virtual WAN hub, and pick your hub. Uh, what and I was going to show IP, is, mm -hmm. and the public IP that you have, you only get that one uh, front end public IP in this experience. You can have many more public IP addresses. So okay. you can have uh, uh, more. I, ju okay. I, I just have one, and you can select all of them here. And the prefix support is there as well? Uh, yes. So additional prefix support. Uh, okay. So this is for excluding those public addresses from treated as public. Got it. No, and, and under public IP prefixes, uh, public IPs, you could add a prefix list as well. Oh, that's your question. Uh, no, uh, well, you can. Uh, so if you're referring to probably yes, these ones, yes. right? Yes, so, IP prefixes. Uh, yeah, yeah the, the answer is no. You can use the IP address objects from the prefix, but not the prefix itself. Okay, I see. Got you. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Uh, okay, so another way of, thanks for the question though, Nihali, this is, yeah, this is important to highlight. We I did, I did get the same question from a customer not long ago. And yes, uh, IP prefix is not yet there. Maybe, maybe at some point we'll add it. Add it. It's just a convenient thing of just specifying the prefix and then um, using that. And Todd, I have mm -hmm. another question. Uh, can you select outbound internet public IP on a per source or per app basis with Palo integrated in virtual one? Um, so the answer to that is no. Uh, you when you select the um, that those SNAT IPs for outbound, you can select individual IP addresses, so you can have five, ten, twenty. Uh, but it will be just semi-random. You you're not able to specify an outbound SNAT rule to say like from this private IP address. I want to snap it to this public IP address. So today that's not available. That's uh, that's a limitation on our side. Um, something that we we could potentially implement. Yeah. Thank you. But the, yeah, the, the, yeah, I've I've had these questions from uh, from customers as well. Uh, most of the time, uh, most of customers I talk to, they typically would have maybe you know up to five public IP addresses for SourceNet. And if they need to allow list it on somewhere else with their partner, they would just uh, allow list all five. So that way, no matter which 
SourceNet IP address Azure picks from, from this selected list, uh, that traffic will uh, flow through. And sorry, Anton, I have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Is this feature instead available in the VM series based deployment, not, not integrated inside V1? Oh, oh. Yes. Uh, so with VM series, uh, you can create an any natural you want. So yeah. you absolutely can do that. Yeah, we already. Have I, it on I VM think you series. can manage it from the point of view of the external load balancer without bound rules, bound to different backend tools, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. bound to different uh, private IPs uh, associated to the nick of the of the VM. So it should be possible. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you Thank can you. yeah you can mount, match create an app policy and a rule and have a specific net and specific address to be used for that particular flow. Oh, yeah. okay. Thank yeah. you. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, again, in some cases, if this is uh, a very kind of a, a deal breaker, uh, the VM series might make more sense. Okay, so uh, another way to consume uh, this uh, in virtual WAN, uh, so I have a virtual WAN here with hubs in East and West, and uh, as, as we, you know, as we saw earlier, so these are our NVAs, this is our SAS. So you can go ahead and just create SAS here. And Palo Alto is the only SAS provider today. And that takes you back to this flow of creating it. The only difference is it's already pre-selected the virtual wind hub as the type and the hub that you navigate it from. So two ways to get to the same thing. Uh, so if you're just doing VUN, you probably would be just going through here, hub and the SAS, and you deploy it. The deployment process is the same. Again, takes 15 minutes. Uh, yeah, 15 to 20 minutes to, to create it. And then from here, or from the list of Cloud and GFWs, this is what the firewall looks like. So you, it's healthy. This is its public IP address because I only assigned one. This is that IP address that we were allocated from the V1 hub address space. So this is the private IP address. Uh, so what do we have? So this one is managed by Panorama. So it's connected over a public IP address. You can connect it over a private address as well. So if you have your Panorama on-prem through VPN gateway, uh, as long as we have IP line of sight, uh, the firewall will connect to Panorama and gets its policy. Uh, so, uh, we talked about source NAT for outbound, but then you can also do destination NAT. So if you want traffic to come in uh, into, you know, into your Azure environment through the firewall on that one of those public IP addresses, you can create that NAT rule. It could be some spoke VNets somewhere, and uh, that will that is effectively your NAT rule. But lo and behold, you still have to have a security policy because the firewall, uh, it will allow it and it will uh, source and deem at that traffic, but you also need to have a security policy that allows that traffic. So if it's a web web browsing traffic, if it's something else, if it's uh, uh, something that's using file transfer, we can do that with app ID and everything else. Okay, in this particular, uh, for this particular firewall, the policy is managed by Panorama. So if you go to security policy, it just says, go to your Panorama. And this is this is uh, my Panorama instance, which coincidentally also runs in Azure. So you can absolutely host this. It's available in the marketplace. Uh, so that makes things easier. And I'll show you how this firewall shows up in Panorama. So uh, under Manage Devices, you will see that there will be a device group that corresponds to this firewall. And you can see those three instances. You can actually see how many you have in the back end. As you, as the, you send more traffic to the firewall, you'll see more VMs shown up here. Uh, when, when the traffic load uh, kind of dies down, you'll see that they will be taken out of the cluster. So they'll go disconnected, but don't panic. It's OK. Uh, they just we remove them from Azure. And they, they we keep them just in case it's a, like a connectivity blip uh, to make sure you know if uh, should they come back, they have a place to, to come in. Uh, and after a certain number of hours, we actually clear them out. So this is that firewall in the Cloud and GFW in West US. 
we associated the template stack with it. So it's going to get its policy uh, that is configured here. So for any Palo Alto users out there, this will look familiar. So these policies, as I said, source, destination, app ID, URL categories, uh, services, security profiles, whether it's you know antivirus, vulnerability, anti-spyware, all of that is available here. Uh, objects, external dynamic list, dynamic user groups, um, uh, profiles, uh, and you can also integrate uh, the Azure plugin. So not only for Cloud and GFW, but also to monitor Azure service tags. Uh, so what that means is Panorama will go into Azure using the service principle and fetch about 1,200 service tags, depending on you know on your particular environment. And these service tags will give you IP addresses. So let's say I want to create a policy for something like Cosmos DB, uh, and these are the IP addresses. Uh, oh, that's, I guess this taking some time. Sorry, I was impatient. Is populating those IP addresses that it learned from Azure. There we go. And then you can create tags for those addresses and use it as your matching criteria in your security policy. So these IP addresses can change. The plugin will keep them updated. The firewall will keep them updated. You do not need to do anything, uh, any policy updates when you use that, um, you know, uh, uh, a dynamic address group that is associated with this service tag. So this is really powerful, uh, and uh, it gives you that experience of creating a policy using Azure service tags. So uh, that that you can do with Panorama. Um, so this was the firewall that was deployed in West US. I'm going to show you the one in East US. This firewall is um, is deployed uh, using Azure Local Rule Stack. You can do that. You can have both, but uh, you can mix. So this one is managed by Azure Rule Stack right here. You can say local rule stack, and this is where you manage the policy in Azure. So this, these are your rules. Uh, there's the default rule, and you can go ahead and create a rule to uh, allow certain traffic based on countries uh, or based on uh, IP addresses, prefix lists, uh, or app ID, again, match on a specific application ID. Uh, and you can be fairly granular uh, to say, let's say I want to allow uh, OneDrive downloads, but I want to block OneDrive uploads. With app ID, we are actually able to determine the difference. So we can say uh, MS OneDrive, and we can say, okay, downloads are allowed, but uploads are blocked. And this is not using URLs. This is purely looking what's what's the content, what's the behavior looking like. Is this session an upload session or a download session? So, uh, yeah, that's app ID. Uh, URL token categories. So I think it's like 60 plus categories uh, that you can use. This is really useful for outbound based on your organization policy. You can block things that are inappropriate based on your internal policy. Uh, and then obviously you can uh, block it, drop it, reset. Uh, you can decrypt, as I said, using uh, TLS certs in Key Vault. And you can log it to Azure Log Analytics Workspace. So this is going to look like this. Uh, you can go into logs. And these are your firewall traffic logs in Azure Log Analytics Workspace. So there you go. This was an SSL application. It was allowed. Uh, it went to this IP address in the United States. Uh, and this was the source VM that it was sourced from. So right here, we do have a connector with Sentinel. So you can uh, associate this Log Analytics Workspace with Sentinel and run your hunting queries and all that in Sentinel. Um, OK, so this is logging. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, oh, I, I forgot to show you routing intent. <laughs> the most important thing. Uh, so uh, this is no different than any any other you know uh, route intent implementation. When you created and deployed all of this, this is how you switch the traffic. So fast solution, and this is our 
east us firewall uh, and on, on that hub and that's how the traffic goes through cloud into w this is all we need to do uh, configure it and save it v1 will handle the rest it will uh, make sure that traffic goes through cloud and gfw uh, in both directions in this case uh, managed nva obviously will come into a network virtual appliance so the experience will be the same uh, so no udrs to to deal with all right i will pause for questions yeah, and then uh, Nihali here. Um, a quick question. Um, did you say, uh, and maybe I missed it, but are service tags supported with the Azure rule stack? Uh, there are not. Uh, okay. Service tags are supported only through only, Panorama. Uh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, through Panorama, uh, through Azure plugin. So here, as I, as I showed you in local rule stack, uh, we're not yet uh, able to. Um, to select service tags as destination or source criteria in, in that uh, rule configuration. Yeah. Got it, yeah. And just um, for additional clarifications for our viewers, um, when we did the lab, um, you showed the DNAT rule before, but it does both DNAT and SNAT at that point, correct? Uh, correct. Yes. Uh, if we go back to the diagram that I showed here, uh, so yes, when that traffic comes in through that load balancer, uh, mm -hmm. it is using floating IP configuration, so it doesn't change the packet. It just gets it to the VM series, and the VM series will swap the destination IP address, which is the public IP address, with the private IP address of your workload where you send it to. But as this traffic leaves this interface, it will swap the source traffic to the interface traffic, with, to the interface IP address, which would be part of your V1 hub address. Got it. So we don't see the original IP. Instead, we would see the uh, IP from that um, VVAN hub space uh, that's right. allocated to the yeah. VM series. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. And, that, and that's where XFF header comes Headers, in, yeah. yeah it comes handy if you do have a proxy somewhere out that populates that uh, header we can mm -hmm. apply policy based on that header but we won't touch it if it's there yeah. we'll keep it and we can apply the policy uh, but uh, yeah because we do NAT and we're not using gateway load balancer uh, that's that's what's going to happen got it thank you thank you for the question Howie. Oh, uh, unless there are any other questions, uh, I'd like to thank you for for your time uh, discussing and asking very good questions about Cloud NGFW and just our firewall platform available in Azure. Is there a question? Uh, I have a very last question, Anton. Uh, I posted it First. In, the, in the chat also. I just wanted to ask if, if it would be possible to have like a sort of uh, comparison a feature comparison list between the vm series nba in v1 next generation firewall in v1 solutions like i mean every day we are asked by customers if feature xyz in palo is available in a certain type of deployments and many times i'm personally having troubles to to answer so that would be great uh of course and uh so my best recommendation is to go to our live community so palo alto networks live community and under product network security you can click cloud and gfw for azure here you will find uh, a lot of useful information but that mm, feature comparison that you asked about between cloud and gfw and vm series it's published here so it's okay. a it's a big scary table uh that goes one by one uh and compares like Oh, much, the, like, that's exactly what we yeah. need. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Can, can you share uh, the link here in, in the chat? Uh, yeah, the, absolutely. I, I'll, se I'll send a bunch of links to the chat once we're finished here. Uh, there's also our documentation. And then there's a bunch of stuff on Microsoft Learn, actually. So for Virtual mm -hmm. WAN, there's uh, this article that shows you all the flows, what's supported, the limitations, and everything. Um, then there's uh, just Cloud and GFW specific uh, 
uh, page that uh, gives you uh, kind of yeah what what this is why what uh, uh, and yeah and there's uh, I think there's some how tos I did mention uh, application gateway so this article is here as well um, shows you how to integrate the application gateway and put it in front of the cloud and GFW so th there's lots of lots of good, good things out there and we are continuing to publish more uh, yeah between Microsoft and Palo Alto uh, yeah. That's, that's great. Uh, thank you for this very useful. First. Excellent. Thank you. And then awesome stuff. Um, look forward to the um, integrated NV offering as well. And um, yeah, we'll share the links um, below everything that Anton showed us to today. And of course, um, anything else, Cynthia, you want to um, add um, before we end the session today? No, I think it was clear and complete. Thank you, Anton. Awesome. Thanks, everyone, for joining, and um, we'll see you in the next session.